thank you, Christy. Mm -hmm. How we feed our babies, intersections in parenting and maternal well being. Um, Jennifer is associate professor in the Department of Psychological Science, College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, she earned her doctorate in developmental psychology at the University of California, Irvine in 2009. She joined the faculty at Boise State in 2012 after completing a postdoc at UNC Greensboro. Uh, her research interests are in infant, early child development, particularly parenting and the family's role in children's social development. In recent work, she's been exploring infant feeding practices and how this relates to parents' behavior and well-being. So Jennifer, the floor is yours. You're muted too. There, I should there be unmuted go. now, hopefully. Yes. Excellent. Okay, and my screen is sharing, right? Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you all. Um, so uh, today I want to look, talk a little bit about um, one particular line of research that I've been exploring over the past few years. Um, and to kick that off, I just wanted to kind of share a little bit of a, a scenario. There we go. So let's think about a young mother. This is her first child. The mother's in the hospital, amazed at the newborn, but terrified about how to care for it. She has it in her head that she should be breastfeeding and that she should know how to do it. Everyone breastfeeds, it shouldn't be a problem to do. Uh, but the reality is it's hard. She struggles. She's unable to get a good latch. She's exhausted. She feels the weight of that baby's well being hanging on her. Her mother, who is also visiting, suggests she just give a bottle. Isn't that the easier way to do this? What's the problem with that? But the thought of bottle feeding her child fills this mother with guilt. That's not the way you're supposed to feed your baby. So this is the first real task of motherhood that this mother has to address how the baby is fed. She has to determine what she's going to do at this critical juncture because the baby has to be fed. Uh, and so how do we understand this first task of motherhood and the psychological implications that this very first task has for this mother and how it lays a path, a groundwork for understanding that mother-child relationship as they go forward. So this then forms the foundation of, of, of my work and trying to understand the intersection between early feeding and parenting. Typically, when we look at the literature on breastfeeding, you'll find most of it in the medical literature. There really is not a whole lot of psychological work being done on infant feeding practices. We know a lot about the health benefits, for both baby and mom, but I'm interested much more in understanding how infant feeding actually lays the groundwork for early parenting practices. So to first examine this, I worked with a colleague on a longitudinal data set, and the outcome we were interested in was maternal sensitivity. So maternal sensitivity, for those that aren't familiar with it, is just that basic idea of um, the parent's ability to read their child's cues, to respond appropriately to their child's needs, and to not be uh, overly intrusive in their interactions with the child. And we know that maternal sensitivity, for example, uh, really is a critical factor in understanding healthy development in children and a critical um, part of understanding uh, parenting, positive parenting practices. So my question then was whether um, breastfeeding duration predicts longer term maternal, maternal sensitivity in families. And to answer this, uh, we looked at a data set with over a thousand moms and babies in it that were followed through the child's uh, early adolescent years. And the answer we found was that yes, the longer a mother breastfeeds her child, uh, they, that we saw actual increases in maternal sensitivity over the next decade of time. So uh, this suggests that something's happening during that very early infant feeding uh, period of time during infancy and early uh, toddlerhood that is somehow setting in motion a cascade of positive benefits for mothers and their parenting behaviors. 
but this was a, a fairly limited data set in terms of what we had available. All we knew was how long mothers said they breastfed and their sensitivity measures, but we didn't know too many details about whether they were exclusively breastfeeding or how that feeding was actually taking place. Uh, so uh, we set out then to do uh, more of a, a pilot study to look at a little more fine-grained analysis of, of these ideas. So to do that, we recruited 60 first-time mothers and from the Treasure Valley, and they were all um, community sample, no clinical indicators. Uh, and we interviewed those moms at the third trimester of their pregnancy about their expectations for parenting, um, their expectations around feeding, their current well being, their depressive symptoms, things like that. And we then followed those moms up at two weeks postpartum to see what, what feeding practices they were doing, what their mental health was looking like. Uh, we followed them up again at three months with, with similar questions and also at six months. And at six months, they also came into the lab and we did an observation of the mother and the child together to look at those um, mother-child interaction and sensitivity measures. So analyses on the kind of the big questions on that are underway. We haven't had a chance to fully delve into the big questions around sensitivity, but we're now beginning to get some snapshots of what those, those mothers' experiences were. So for example, uh, we see that mothers who report greater depressive symptoms at two weeks are showing lower breastfeeding self-efficacy and overall lower parenting self-efficacy at three and six months. So in next steps, um, I'd like to continue to explore the profound changes that mothers undergo as they become parents. Uh, I'd like to delve a little bit more in how mothers experience their breastfeeding journey and how this uh, can affect their parenting behavior and well-being over the adjustment to parenthood. I'd like to look at whether bottle feeding can convey the same advantages in terms of that parent-child interaction that breastfeeding does. Or what can we encourage bottle feeding mothers to do that would convey similar benefits? And I'd also like to look at what effective supports can really be put in place to help mothers uh, during this critical transition time. So that is my brief presentation. <laughs> Great. That's very interesting. Nice job. Really very cool stuff. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, okay. So um, our next speaker is Ellen Schaefer. So Ellen, if you wanna share your slides, that'd be great. Um, uh, Ellen uh, is an assistant professor in the Department of Community and Environmental Health in our College of Health Sciences. She earned her PhD in public health with an emphasis on community and behavioral health from the University of Iowa in 2015 and completed a postdoc fellowship in maternal and child health at the University of South Florida before coming to Boise State in 2018. Her main research objective is to understand the mechanisms by which social context and social network influences are associated with health behaviors. And she typically applies these factors to studies of infant feeding and care. So Ellen, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. And it's perfect timing to put me right behind Jennifer, so. I tried, I did, good I work. really tried to put things in a good order. Good work, good work. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for this opportunity to share with you all today. Um, in my research, I'm interested in the social context of health and health behaviors, particularly the way in which social networks and social support systems enhance or even sometimes undermine the health behaviors and well being of caregivers. I began this work in relation to infant care and feeding behaviors of new moms by exploring the roles and functions of a mom's social network in relation to her breastfeeding outcomes. So for example, like following Jennifer, while we might think that moms would breastfeed, would breastfeed for longer durations if someone in their network encouraged them to, to breastfeed no matter what, what we found is that authoritarian point of view um, isn't actually true. Instead, a more understanding network member or somebody telling a mom that it's okay if they use both breastfeeding and formula feeding to feed their baby, they actually breastfeed for longer. 
Another line of research that we've done is looking at returning to work as return to work is associated with a decrease in breastfeeding. We explored the social consequences of breastfeeding or pumping in a work or childcare environment. And to do this, we interviewed childcare administrators about their human milk and formula policies and perceptions about breastfeeding at the center. We discovered that while almost all administrators said breast is best, it wasn't always true for their childcare environments. Many administrators touted the dangers of breast milk as a body fluid and shamed moms who chose to breastfeed their child at the center by suggesting they sit in a closet or go to their car because someone might see them or be offended. These findings highlight the importance of moms having someone in their network who supports breastfeeding for the health of the baby but also supports moms as individuals with their own needs, feelings, and stresses. This is beneficial not just for the mom's health, but also for her infant care and feeding behaviors. In many ways, being a new parent is very similar to being an unpaid family caregiver. New parents endure many of the same social consequences as family caregivers <coughs> in terms of a perceived loss of established social network and support systems, building of a new system that gets what you're going through, changes in role identity, and potential undermining from family and friends who don't think that you're doing it right. Over the past year, I've had the opportunity to expand my research methods to caregiving populations through collaboration with the Center for the Study of Aging and the Idaho Caregiver Alliance. Last summer, we interviewed people who are relatives as parents, typically grandparents parenting grandchildren. We asked questions about caregiver burden, coping, coping with COVID-19, and social support systems. What we learned is that many relative as, relatives as parents have lost their social support systems or their network members are thought to no longer be able to relate to their experiences and stresses. So while these losses might be dramatic and significant, these caregivers also told, told us about other forms of social capital that they've built and gained because of their experience. Relative as parent support groups are key to sharing and learning new ideas for caring for young children, many of whom have complicated histories and diagnoses due to parental drug use, neglect, or incarceration. Formal service providers like therapists and doctors link caregivers to resources, and teachers provide academic support and encouragement to both the children and the caregivers. For relatives as parents, their own social support system changes from typical friends and family to other relative as parent families and formal service providers. This highlights a key need to find families who may be informally in a caregiving situation and help connect them to other families, trusted service providers, and give them the tools necessary to communicate effectively with school personnel and teachers to build their social networks resources and uh, support to help alleviate caregiving burden. In addition to continuing to analyze our data from this summer, we are currently working to explore how we might further support and increase self-advocacy of relatives as parents to navigate the medical, legal, and social components of caring for a child due to parental drug or alcohol use. We have partnered with the Idaho Office of Drug Policy to conduct a needs assessment of relatives as parents to help build those resources, services, and social supports, both informal and uh, both informal and informal caregiving situations. I see this needs assessment work uh, eventually turning into exploring the needs of other caregiver populations and piloting, then testing an, inter an intervention to build social assets among caregivers and decrease caregiver burden, stress, isolation, and to that end, I'm interested in learning more from others who might like to collaborate on intervention development and evaluation related to caregiving, uh, building social assets and capital, or enhancing interpersonal level interventions for caregivers of infants and children. Thanks for your time. That's great, Ellen. Uh, really important work. I'm sure you will find some collaborators. I can think of at least one in this group. So thanks so much. Okay, so um, next we have Cindy Curl. 
CINI will be presenting agricultural pesticides, controlling pests, protecting farm workers, and safeguarding consumers. CINI is a, a director, associate professor, and director of the Center for Excellence in Environmental Health and associate prof in the Department of Community Environmental Health in our College of Health Sciences. She earned her PhD in environmental and occupational health sciences from the University of Washington in 2014 and joined the Department of Community Environmental Health at Boise State here in 2015. Um, her primary research interests are in assessing human exposure to agricultural pesticides and improving health and safety in agricultural workplaces. Cindy, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I know this might seem a little far afield from maternal and child health at the outset, but I promise to bring us back around. Um, so I'm broadly interested in the ways that agricultural production affects human health. And more specifically, I'm most interested in the human health effects of agricultural pesticides. Now, certainly as a society, we need to produce food on a large scale, and there are very real weed and insect pests that can challenge our ability to do that. And we need to be realistic about managing those pests. On the other hand, most pesticides are by definition toxic. They wouldn't work very well if they weren't. And we need to protect the folks that work in agriculture and live in agricultural communities from the potential negative health effects of these substances. I would also argue that we need to be very aware of the levels of pesticide residues that make it into our food supply. My research agenda essentially has two main tracks which are closely connected. The first of these tracks is the side of my work that looks at farm workers, and I'm primarily focused on women who work in agriculture. Over the past few decades, there has been a dramatic increase in the percentage of our agricultural workforce that is comprised of women. In 2000, just over 10% of the farm workers in the US were women. Now that number has grown to over 25%. These pictures were all taken in the past year in Idaho. This first one is women sorting potatoes. These are women planting hops, and these are women harvesting hops. Many of these women are of childbearing age. Many work during pregnancy, basically right up until delivery, and sometimes they bring their children to work with them. And yet most of the policies and procedures that exist to safeguard farm workers from pesticide exposure don't necessarily acknowledge these changing demographics. Studies show that one size fits all personal protective gear actually just fits most men. And when labor contractors are deciding who to send to pesticide safety trainings, they tend to send men. And this is despite the fact that there is an ever increasing number of women who we know are applying pesticides. In some of our own research, my colleagues Lisa Morato and Rebecca Sam Castiano from Anthropology and Sociology, we recruited a group of 70 Latina women working in agriculture. And we measured pesticide metabolite levels in urine samples collected from a subset of these women. We found dramatically higher pesticide metabolite levels among women who reported applying pesticides, and particularly among women who reported never receiving any pesticide safety training. These levels are far higher than we typically see in men who work in agriculture, and in some cases they exceeded safety thresholds. We hypothesize that this is directly related to ill-fitting equipment and a lack of training. Several pesticides we measured are known to be particularly harmful to developing fetuses that may experience in utero exposures. The second track of my research agenda investigates pesticide exposure in the general population. Here, my research team and I are interested in measuring dietary pesticide exposure with a particular focus on pregnant women. In our most recent work, we recruited a group of women during their first trimesters of pregnancy and provided each woman with weekly deliveries of either organic or conventional produce for about six months each until they delivered their babies. This photo is taken from the clean kitchen side of my lab, and you can see three sets of produce as examples of what was delivered to our study participants. We also collected weekly urine samples from each participant during their first trimester until they delivered their babies, and we measured those samples for seven metabolites of common agricultural pesticides. And here's what we found. Our study was the longest organic diet intervention study that's been done. Again, this dietary intervention lasted a full six months, and it was the first such to look at pregnant women. We observed much lower pesticide metabolite concentrations in women who received the deliveries of the organic food. And in this figure on the right, the metabolite concentrations are on the y-axis and the boxes represent the range of measured concentrations. Women that received the conventional produce are shown in blue. Those that were in the organic group are shown in green. 
The upshot, therefore, is that we found significant differences in insecticide exposure between these two groups, suggesting that individuals with conventional diets are exposed to low but measurable amounts of these pesticides, which are not present in organic diets, and this may represent an important source of exposure. Ultimately, in my lab, we want to understand how agricultural pesticide exposures may affect the health of women and children and to characterize how any such exposure might be occurring so that we can develop mitigation strategies to protect public health while still ensuring a robust food supply. Thanks. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you, Cindy, for that. All right. Okay, so our next uh, presenter is Aaron Mannon. And uh, Aaron, if you have slides, you want to share them, go for it. And um, Can Aaron, you? Uh, it's a yeah. PhD, uh, Assistant Professor of Mechanical and Biomechanical Engineering in the College of Engineering. Uh, she earned her PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Kansas in 2014 and completed a postdoc fellowship at the Center for Orthopedic Biomechanics at the University of Denver in 2017. Her research focus is biomechanics with particular interest in infant musculoskeletal development and safety of commercial baby gear. Yes, it's all yours, Erin. All right, I recorded mine, so it's five minutes exactly. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Erin Mannon. I am the director of the Boise Applied Biomechanics of Infants, the Baby Lab, here at Boise State. I'm an assistant professor in the Mechanical and Biomedical Engineering Department. I received my PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Kansas in 2014, and after a postdoc at the University of Denver, I was faculty for three years at the University of Arkansas's Medical School and Orthopedic Surgery Department. My lab consists of my postdoc, Dr. Sapir Siddiqui, and uh, several graduate and undergraduate students. The mission of the Baby Lab is to use biomechanics to explore the impact of commercial products and orthopedic devices on the musculoskeletal development and safety of babies. And this is how we do that. We utilize common tools of the trade and in vivo biomechanics, such as motion capture, electromyography, force plates, pressure sensors, and more, and adapt them to work on our infant population. We then are able to look at motion, muscle activity, and uh, human movement in general to understand how babies are moving and using their muscles in commercial products. The premise of our musculoskeletal research is that position and movement impacts joint development. We know that some musculoskeletal disorders such as plagiocephaly or even hip dysplasia are caused by very specific positions. Uh, we also have some evidence that uh, through recent animal models that show muscle unloading of a fetal and neonatal hip um, promotes hip dysplasia. Finally, there's some computational models that support the ideas that position and muscle activity impact early hip development. However, until, until now, there have been no experimental biomechanic studies in infant musculoskeletal development. We know that babies spend hours every day in various types of devices. So the questions that my lab hopes to answer are, how are these babies' bodies positioned within the devices? How are they using or not using their muscles within those devices? And what might the answer to those questions mean for development of the hip spine skull? How is safety impacted in these devices? So we're trying to use biomechanics to answer some of these very important questions. Our recently completed research looked at a, a cohort of healthy infants um, in various positions, including lying on their backs, um, in, in the pavic harness, which is used to treat hip dysplasia, in baby carriers, held in arms, on their tummies, and in car seats. And we found that babies are passive in car seats, so they're not using their muscles, they're not moving, it's a passive device. They are, however, using several muscle groups uh, when they are held in an upright baby carrier. Um, the hip position is also similar in the baby carrier to um, the 
pavlocarnist, which is used to treat hip dysplasia. So we have some questions about um, design of baby carriers and positive impact on hip health. Uh, so we've published a couple papers specifically looking at spinal uh, muscle activity and lower extremity position and muscle activity in various positions. And we're really looking to understand what these devices mean for musculoskeletal development. We also uh, had a breakthrough study with the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission in 2019, where we looked at how babies were moving and using their muscles in a specific product class. This was an inclined sleeper. We put babies in these various products and found that in these inclined sleep products, it was potentially easier for them to roll over into a prone position. And then once they were in that position, it really, uh, it increased the demands on their musculoskeletal system and increased their suffocation risk. The results of this project actually um, were a recall of the product class nationwide. Ongoing projects, uh, we're clearly still interested in musculoskeletal uh, development of babies. We want to get into computational modeling. We have um, increased interest in safety of, of commercial baby devices. Um, and, you know, several other ideas. So I'd love to hear from you and learn about how we can collaborate across this campus. Thanks for listening. There's my email address and my academic Twitter. Thanks. Thanks, Erin. That's really great stuff, man. All this stuff that everybody's doing is just, there's a lot going on with uh, infant child development. This is just great. So great. Okay, so our next um, speaker is Irina Bobic. Um, Irina is a PhD in, uh, in works in the Department of uh, Psychological Sciences. Uh, she received her PhD in psychology from UNC Greensboro in 2014 and conducted postdoc research in the Department of Physical Therapy at the University of Delaware. She joined Boise State in 2019. Her research focuses on cognitive development in infancy and childhood, including the role of sensory motor exploration and problem solving and cognitive development. So Irina, it's all yours. Hey, thank you. Uh, today I would like to describe this cascade from early motor skills to later cognitive skills. And I represent this cascade right here. So if we look here, you can understand that ability to sit independently and support the trunk frees the hands of the child for reaching and object exploration, which in turn result in information gathering and learning, which actually informs cognitive development. So let me show you some examples. So here on the left is the seven months old child born full term. And if you present a toy to this child, you see the nice trunk control reaching for the toy, grasping of the toy, and lots of interaction with the toy, including oral exploration and all different modalities of exploration. And the same age child born preterm on the right, you see the huge difference. You see no trunk control, you see no reaching towards the toy. And imagine this child will not collect all this useful information about the objects and relations among different objects. And what happens later to these children, look at the age of 12 months, on the left, I have a child born full term, and she is engaged with the means and problem solving task. She understands that the towel is the mean to get to the end, to the toy, right? So she can problem solve. And the child on the right, same age, and he cannot solve this problem. He doesn't understand the relation between the towel and the, the toy. So when time comes for this child to go to the school, some learning delays will be probably identified in this child. And what happens usually that intervention comes at the school uh, age when people try to intervene with the cognitive developmental outcomes, with the delays in cognitive development. But we really believe that intervention should come sooner, much sooner, and should focus this early developing motor development skills. And that's what we did in my previous research when we tried to design and test exoskeletons uh, to encourage children to reach and explore objects. 
So here on the left, we see the child with arthrogryposis and she tries to play, but she really cannot do much because muscles in her arms are too weak. And within the same session, the video on the right shows the child in five minutes. The only difference is that we place the flexible anti-gravity support inserts under her arms. It's the same baby five minutes later, and she's able to play. She's able to do some sophisticated manipulations and see the relations between different objects. So imagine her problem solving skills will be improved tremendously and her cognitive development as well. So for the future research, I would like to relate this early sensory motor skills to later math and executive function skills in two different domains, in the context of disability and as well in the cultural context. And you might say, wait a second, those are different domains, but actually they are just the two sides of the same coin. So let me explain this. Let's look at the uh, disability aspect. Let's look at the child with cerebral palsy, which is usually caused by brain injury, which usually limits fine motor skills like block play, writing skills, as well as visual spatial working memory and spatial pattern recognition. And imagine those kids with spatial pattern recognition are not doing great in subitizing. Subitizing is recognizing the number by just looking at the pattern. So you and I can say that this is five and this is four in, on those pictures and we don't have to count, right? This is subitizing, we're great at this, but kids with cerebral palsy are not good at that. And interestingly, previous research showed that subitizing is positively related to counting, arithmetic skills, and math, which in turn are positively related to executive function, which is ability to play, focus attention, switch between tasks, and problem solve. So imagine these delays in uh, early sensory motor skills result in later delays in math and executive function. But on the other hand, imagine this child practicing calligraphy every day, right? Writing Chinese characters, which requires lots of fine motor activity, visual attention, hand-eye coordination, pattern recognition, visual memory. So imagine this child will probably be very good at recognizing patterns, at subitizing, and probably will be good at math and executive function. So when we say that Asian students outperform American students in math and executive function, maybe that is due to parental practices. Maybe it's actually due to this earlier advanced uh, sensory motor skills. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. I don't know if you and Aaron have worked together, but man, the op there's some pretty obvious connections there. Very cool. Okay. Um, okay, next uh, is um, Cynthia Campbell uh, in the Department of uh, Psychological Sciences. Uh, Cynthia earned her PhD in developmental psychology from Penn State University in 2010. Uh, she saw for three different university published in the family science and in the scholarship of teaching and learning and consulted on community grant projects. She has a passion for studying human relationships, how they influence the way we view ourselves, others, and the world around us. So Cynthia, it's all yours. Thank you, Bob. So the title of my talk is The Importance of Fathers in the Lives of Children and Ways to Support Their Involvement. And I'd like to just start by asking you to consider for a moment, how, um, our, how is fatherhood viewed in our society? And what, what exactly is a father's role as a parent? Are they a backup parent? A, uh, are they mother's support system? Are they the breadwinner? Are they the fun parent? <laughs> so thinking about that, um, you know, even though more egalitarian gender roles are emerging in our society, fathers continue to have less power in the home than mothers. And in a short overview of my research interests, I would like to explain why I see that as a problem and suggest one way that we might better support fathers. So first, this issue connects to my research on father-child um, relationships. And it builds on evidence that a father's influence on children is unique and it's important. So fathers often play with their children in, um, in physical ways or in games, 
And that kind of play fosters independence and um, comp competitive behaviors in children that can have benefits. Additionally, father-child relationships that are characterized by involvement, by communication, by closeness, and by paternal approval have been found to promote all kinds of positive psychological adjustment, to impact children's academic success, it builds self-confidence and self-reliance, identity achievement, and those effects are both unique and go beyond the effects of mothers that mothers have on children. Second, my research on maternal gatekeeping and some research we did on divorced fathers suggests that fathers' parenting is more disruptive um, or more, more susceptible to disruption, excuse me, more susceptible to disruption than mother's parenting. So previous research has shown that sometimes mothers engage in what's called gatekeeping behaviors, where they might discourage or encourage or try to control father's involvement with their children. And when mothers do that, gen fathers generally respond by withdrawing engagement in also, divorced fathers are particularly vulnerable because in their role as a parent, there's less um, social, there's less prominence of that role in society. And because we know that fathers draw a lot of support for parenting from the mother of their children, from that relationship. And so a lot of divorced fathers' um, support system is disrupted and they're in a more disenfranchised place as a parent. So we know that fathers can be more vulnerable than mothers. I, there's also the focus of my most recent research on co-parenting, I believe holds the key to addressing this wider issue of support for fatherhood. So co-parenting entails the attitudes and the behaviors that result um, as part of the quality of the teamwork between parents as they attempt to parent their children. So it's really about that teamwork. And it includes things like support and also sometimes undermining of the other parent. Uh, it includes parent solidarity. It includes the, how the child-related labor in the home is divided between parents. And it includes the joint management of the family. And intervention and education efforts around co-parenting that trains parents to be more effective in the way they the way they coordinate and work with each other as parents, uh, that can have far reaching effects for the well being of both parents and their children. And so, you know, my, the larger goal underlying my work is really to work on supporting healthier co parenting relationships. And the results of my study suggest that um, there are a number of factors that underlie that or that contribute to the the quality of that co-parenting relationship. And we're investigating things like trust and identity issues. We're investigating workplace demands. We're even investigating social media comparisons to other families as a factor that kind of contributes to how people co-parent. And so the larger goal really is to support healthier co-parenting relationships. And by doing that, bring fathers into a more supported, more central parenting role one that's more equal and more acknowledged. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, it's very important work. Appreciate you uh, working on that and sharing that with us. That's great, great stuff. Okay, um, so next um, is Sean Gann, uh, who is in the uh, Department of Crim uh, Criminal Justice School of Public Service. Uh, Dr. Gann received his PhD in, in um, criminal justice from the University of Cincinnati in 2017. Uh, his research interests include correctional programming and policy, juvenile, just, juvenile justice policy, juvenile court decision making, developmental criminology, criminal careers, and quantitative or quantitative analytic methods. His work has appeared in many leading peer reviewed journals. So Sean, glad to have you. It's all yours. Um, thank you. So mine is uh, my my little short talk here is a, a little different than than most of other people um, in terms of where I'm focusing. 
Um, so I'm looking at a lot of a lot of my research um, looks at specifically looking at development, cognitive development, as well as biological development, um, and how it affects juveniles' competence and their legal culpability if they are um, arrested for a crime. Um, so two primary um, things that in, in this kind of branch of my research that I've been looking at, um, again, the first one, should adolescents be held to adult standards of criminal culpability, um, meaning, you know, blameworthiness, should they be considered as responsible for their crimes as, as, as adults are? Um, so we know that, that an offender is, is what we call a fully responsible moral agent um, and thus deserves full punishment for, for crimes if they have the capacity to make a rational decision and um, a fair opportunity to choose not to engage in the offense. And the question, as I'll talk about on the next slide really quick, um, the question really becomes, do, do, do juveniles fit those criteria? Um, so we're, when we're talking about here, some of the, you know, our past research has looked at these, these cognitive capacities. So um, understanding and reasoning um, and, and abstract problem solving, we know that those tend to develop earlier um, in, in adolescence than, you know, psychosocial markers such as, um, you know, future orientation and resistance to external pressure and um, reduced impulsivity, um, you know, mature judgment, things like that. Um, so, and we also know that, you know, the, the, the gap between that, that increase that kids have or juveniles, adolescents have um, in sensation seeking at puberty um, and then the, the later the development of, of that mature self-regulation um, makes adolescence a time of inherently, you know, immature judgment. So how that applies to a juvenile's culpability um, when they're, you know, again, when they're arrested for a crime. And then the second part, looking at competency, um, do adolescents possess the necessary cap um, capabilities to function as competent defendants in court proceedings? According to the U.S. Comp uh, competition. Uh, I told you I have March Madness on my brain. Um, according to the U.S. Constitution, um, you have to have a, 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 a somebody that is arrested to go through court proceedings. They have to be considered competent. Now, different states define that differently. I won't get into that. That's a whole other uh, cluster. Um, but um, do juveniles, you know, are juveniles consider that? We know that the younger that a, a youth is, the more likely they are to waive their constitutional protections. Specifically, we're typically talking about like the Miranda rights that I have down there, the right to remain silent, the right to have an attorney present, um, um, you know, the right against self-incrimination, things like that. Um, we also know through prior research that younger youth are less understanding of the meaning and the importance of those Miranda rights. A lot of the times, you know, youth have reported to us that it's just, you know, words. They don't really understand what they were doing or even signing off waiving their constitutional rights. So two main areas, again, that culpability issue and then the competency issue. Um, so my current research that I'm looking at, um, uh, again, looks at those two things. Um, so you have to have three things. Courts have said you have to have three things to be considered competent to stand trial. You have to have a factual understanding of the proceedings of the process. So this just pretty much means that you can, you know, meaningly for, uh, participate in, in, in the process, in the trial process. Um, you have to have a rational understanding of the proceedings. And if you're familiar with the Supreme Court, they hate being specific on the word rational. Um, they are not good by any means at defining, operationalizing what that word rational means. Um, and then the last one, the ability to assist counsel in your defense. Um, so if any of those three things are lacking, then most states you would be considered incompetent or not competent to stand trial. So the question that I'm looking at is really, do juveniles have these abilities uh, to be able to, to meaningly participate and to assist their counsel if they're arrested for a crime? Um, and then on the culpability issue, we're looking at, again, because based on those um, um, you know, impairments that anybody may have, adult or juvenile, if there's any type of impairment, um, they're less, they're considered less culpable than, you know, quote unquote, the typical offender. So again, based on that, the less developed cognitive capacities, their developmental immaturity, um, do adolescents or should adolescents qualify as an impairment? So that's technically a legal issue, but also an ethical issue as well that I'm looking at. Um, and then so finally, just uh, future directions. Um, so I'm starting up some partnerships. I'm still relatively new to Boise. This is my, my fourth, fourth academic year here at Boise State. 
Um, so I'm already doing some work with some of the juvenile courts in the Department of Juvenile Corrections here in Idaho. But um, for this, this um, um, string of research, I want to have more partnerships with individual juvenile courts as well as the police departments to be able to collect data on that um, um, to, to address those, those two previous questions that I mentioned. And something else that one of my colleagues from the University of Cincinnati and I are doing, um, we're going to try to do it here in Idaho, but also in Ohio. Um, is looking at, and there hasn't really been in the literature, there hasn't really been anything that's, that's focused on this, but we wanna look at um, the court actors. So I'm talking about like juvenile court judges, prosecutors, juvenile defense attorneys, juvenile probation officers, juvenile intake officers. Um, do, the, do those court actors and the law enforcement, what are their actual views? Because obviously independent of what state law says, because again, a lot of them are very vague, their views on these issues, culpability, competency, appropriate punishment, um, is going to dictate how those things play out. And, and you know, if there's ever an ambiguous uh, instance uh, in, in court, their views, those court actors' views that. are going to, sorry, my phone is talking to me, um, are, is, is going to dictate how, how things play out. Um, and when I talk about appropriate punishments there, the main thing I'm looking at is proportionality. Um, punishment, according to the Constitution, is supposed to be proportional to the offense. So we're looking, you know, proportionality based on the harm that a person causes, so the seriousness of the offense, um, but also their blameworthiness. Again, their 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 level of culpability in causing that harm. So we want to get we want to get a very in depth view of the people that are working with these juveniles, both on the law enforcement and the court side, um, their views of 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 those three um, of those three topics. So that is all I have. Thanks, Sean. That's a very important work, obviously. So uh, really support you in that. I think it's great what you're doing. Keep it up. All right. Next is uh, Kelly Chen. Kelly is a professor in the Department of Economics. Uh, she received a PhD in economics from Dalhousie University in Canada and joined Boise State in 2015. Her research interests lie in the field of applied microeconomics on issues related to the labor market and health, educational, and welfare policies. Her current work focuses on the economics of disability, intergenerational transmission of economic status, determinants of child health and development, and decision making within families. Welcome, Kelly. It's all yours. You're on mute. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. I was meaning to say thank you, Bob. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's a very nice uh, meeting all of you today. Um, since I only have uh, less than five minutes today, I'm just going to give you a very uh, brief description of what I've done and uh, the direction of, of my research that I envision going uh, in the near future. Um, as a mixture of a labor economist, health economist, and a uh, applied econometrician, I have been uh, interested in research topics related to the so-called um, program evaluation, uh, in particular, the implications of public labor and health policies for the economic well-being of children and youth. Um, so the typical approach I take I've taken so far to, to conduct my research is really to, to combine some sort of quasi-experimental design with data collected from large-scale nationally representative surveys in attempt to make causal inference. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, uh, randomized control experiments are pretty rare. It's getting popular, but uh, are still pretty rare in economics. So uh, those, those quasi-experimental uh, methods, such as the instrumental variable approach, uh, difference in differences, regression discontinuity, and um, synthetic control, et cetera. Uh, they, they allow us as economists to um, establish this, this cause and uh, effect a relationship between X and Y using observational data. So uh, through those approaches, uh, I have um, investigated for example, uh, the, the spillover effect of uh, disability benefits paid to parents on the health and the development of their non-disabled children. 
I have also looked at, for example, um, whether school policies, um, some school policies inadvertently increase the incidence of the ADHD among young children. Uh, one of my current projects, again, using uh, uh, quasi-experimental evidence, um, explores the possibility of providing more scope for physical activity at school as a promising avenue to help ADHD children and not just uh, including those whose symptoms are well below the clinical threshold and therefore uh, didn't receive a diagnosis of ADHD. And then to address this um, gender, uh, educational gender gap uh, in the long run. Uh, going forward, I would be um, very interested in continuing uh, my investigation in this social determinants of childhood ADHD, um, as it is one of the most uh, commonly diagnosed behavioral disorders among young children. I would be also uh, open to, 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 different, to the different ideas you might have regarding uh, any public policies that uh, promote uh, child health in general. Um, finally, I wanted to say that uh, it's, it's a, such a pleasure to, to connect with you guys today and uh, I look forward to future collaborations with you. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, that's really interesting stuff. I can see some collaborations emerging already. So I think that's great. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Chi Jen tells me she's putting her one-year-old down and asks if we could skip over her. So um, I will, we will come back to her. Uh, so uh, Jerry, I hope um, you're ready. Catch you off guard. <laughs> so our next presenter would, would be Jerry Allen Falls. He's associate professor uh, in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, he's received his PhD in computer science from the University of Maryland in 2009. His area of research is human computer interaction with a current focus on technologies that support children's creativity, mobility, and collaboration. The primary goal of Dr. Phil's current research is to leverage technology to encourage children to engage with their environment and with one another. So Jerry Allen, it's your year floor. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that kind introduction and for organizing this so that we can uh, share our experience with one another. So <clears throat> my, my research experience is divided into two categories. Uh, one is I work on the process of giving children an authentic voice in the design of the technologies that are intended to be used by them. And these technologies are intended, are, are, are technologies that will benefit them, primarily their digital well being, um, and meet their particular needs. <clears throat> so, one of the things that I do in my research is I direct a, an intergenerational design team. And in normal times, you would find me in my lab on the floor with kids. As you notice, they're not wearing masks here. So these are a little bit old. Um, but over the last 18 years that I've been, I, I've had the fortune, good fortune of doing this, we have been able to really um, find some meaningful collaborative techniques to work with children and design technologies that meet their needs. Um, over the last year, We've, uh, it, it's looked a little bit more like this, as many of your meetings might have looked like in the last year. Mm -hmm. um, and while, while there has been, uh, there was research done on how to coordinate participatory design practices, such as those that we, we use uh, in my lab, they have not ever been really fully adopted. Uh, not nearly on the scale as they've had to this last year. And so there are a lot of online, uh, a lot of open questions that we're looking at as to how to build processes and techniques and build the same kind of cooperative, um, collaborative uh, feeling, right? So that, so that the children that we work with, which are aged six to 11 years old, 
really get that sense of being true design partners with their older design partners that are kids at heart still, but a little bit older. Um, <clears throat> and so how do, we, how do we make that happen? And I'm, I'm collaborating with some of my colleagues at the University of Maryland and the University of Washington on some interesting work in that realm. But there are, there are also interesting things that we're looking at as to while right now we're in this somewhat forced online and distributed uh, fashion, how do, we, how do we adapt the technique to hybrid approaches and not just face-to-face, -face, some face-to-face, -face, some fully online, but perhaps different pods or, or different kinds of ways to reach out to people so that we can have meaningful collaborations. Another avenue of my research is not just these processes, but building these technologies that are actually going to help children. Um, so I have a, a graduate student who is working on improving uh, authentication mechanisms for children. So primarily now, many of you, if you have children, probably know that your children have to log in to their computers and sometimes they're given just, you know, like a, a laminated card with their username and password that they have to enter into. And, and hopefully many of you recognize that that's not the greatest security practice. Um, <clears throat> but how do, we, how do we develop authentication mechanisms that can be memorable without having a, a card that they have to refer to, but also so that they have the security strength, so to speak, of um, alphanumeric passwords. And so, um, and, and for, so one of the current, we, we've shown that we can improve memorability. We're trying to improve those passwords still. And I have um, another student that's looking at the social media aspects. Some of you may, may have seen that Facebook just announced that they're, they're creating an Instagram for children uh, less than 13, right? So there, and we already know that right now children use social media because all they have to do is say that they're 13 and then they're on, right? So how do we support them as they bridge into that realm that can be potentially harmful to them and to others? And how do we educate them in that, in that transition? I have two other projects and I'm obviously don't have time to talk about them, but here's one of them, uh, KidFit. And feel free to reach out to me if you are interested in that. And the last one that I'll begin to mention is CAST, which is short for a child adaptive search tool, which is an NSF funded project with some amazing collaborators, one of which will be speaking with you next. Um, but we have uh, in this process, right, we're improving how children access the resources that they need or they intend to find as they search for materials online. Um, as a byproduct, we've developed the best children's spell checker. We're looking at how, how we can improve readability for, uh, or how we convey readability to children um, and then improving search results in, in the future as well. And I'll turn the time over to- uh, Fantastic. Uh, Fantastic. Very interesting stuff. Uh, that's really great. Yes, and you have a collaborator who um, I think was smiling throughout your entire presentation. So I guess I shall introduce her. Soled Pera is associate professor and, uh, and part of the people and information research team in the Department of Computer Science. She received her, received her PhD in, in computer science at Brigham Young University in 2014, subsequently accepted position here in the Department of Computer Science. Her main area of expertise is in information retrieval and her current research work focuses on the application of information retrieval, information extraction, and natural language processing techniques for developing search and recommendation systems primarily for children. Sole, your, your floor. Thank you. So yes, I have to smile because I love cats. So I will tell you more about it in the next slide. But on this one, think about all of you today. How many times have you had an information need and you have turned to your phones or your computer and you have turned to Google 
to find that information. And it's only two o'clock, but I would be willing to bet that most of you have already used Google at some point. Well, we are not the only ones using Google, but Google was created for us as grown up, but not so much for children. So imagine a child typing the keyword Sven, which has been my favorite example ever since I started working on, on that part of my research. If you type Sven on Google, Google assumes that it's a misspelling, that it comes from like quickly typing something, and that instead you meant to type a Sven. So it will correct that spelling to Sven, and then when you search, let's say for a movie, rather than pointing a child to Frozen, it will point the child to the movie Seven, which if you have seen it, it's not. It's the opposite of child appropriate. It's like not even. So this inspired this idea of children are using search engines every day. They're using it at home, they're using it at school. You would say, well, what about if they have their own search engine? There are some attempts to have that happen, but they still go to the ones they know, being, uh, but mostly Google. At the same time, there is no one thing as one size fits all for children. They all have different expectations of what the search engine would do. They have different cognitive abilities that will make them connect with the search engine in a different way. So my research is focused on building bridges, but the algorithmic kind, so that kids at different stages of their life can take better advantage of search engines until they get to the point when they kind of graduate of those bridges. They don't need them anymore, and then they can just directly use Google. So we start with someone very young that would need a lot of, in the terms of interface help, to know how to get to the information that they need until you get to someone older, uh, a high schooler, that they know how to type queries, they know how to kind of scan through the results, but they might need a little bit of help in understanding this idea of fake news and misinformation and how to deal with that when they're engaging with search engines. So the two projects that I wanted to highlight one was CAS. In CAS, what we did is bring together different perspectives from computer science and education in order to be able to focus on what do children and needs, and specifically we're looking at emergent searchers, what do they need in terms of help in the classroom if they're looking for materials for school. The coolest project ever that came out of CAS, and this is ongoing, is these spell checkers. What we did is we look specifically at keywords that kids know when they're young, their phonetic spelling of these keywords, how do they sound the words, and so then when they type, we try to point that they might not be typing keywords the right way, and we help them find what is the right keyword, or what is the one that maybe they wanted to type. And for that, not only we have the algorithmic thing, the spell checker under the hood, but also we show them pictures and we read the words out loud so that they can really pick the one that is the one that they meant to use. And so that not only helps with their spelling, it also helps with a better query that then it will mean a better set of results. And so it will improve the entire search process. We are looking at how kids formulate queries, how they look at results, how do they know which results are the ones that they should be using for school or not. So CAS, it's uh, a, a place of opportunity. So, and we're always looking for outside perspectives because that's what makes CAS um, kind of advance this area of research. In the last 30 seconds that I know that I still have, I wanted to <laughs> chat about literate. We focus on children a lot, but in the classroom, we need to help the teacher because in a classroom, you may have 30 kids, all with different abilities, even though they have the same age, different abilities to read, different cultural backgrounds. So what we're trying to do with researchers from CS and education is trying to build the bridges to help the teacher find online the resources that kids need uh, to support their learning. So let's keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm. this is, these are all the places where you can find me. Mm -hmm. And I think I use exactly five minutes, which it's not easy for me. <laughs> Thank you, Soleil. That's You're great. Welcome. Really, really, really great stuff. This is... And I saw a note from Megan in the chat. Uh, Megan is a new to our institution, works in our college and development. And she, I think she's blown away like the rest of us are with all the great work you all are doing. It's just really wonderful. Um, I'm wondering, Chi Jin, are you back? 
<laughs> no. <laughs> we can we have we can come back in another five minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, then that brings us um, to Lindsay Turner. Uh, Lindsay uh, is a research professor and has this uh, really cool initiative for healthy schools um, that she does. And uh, she received her PhD in psychology from the University of Illinois at Chicago in 2001 and is applied behavioral scientist with expertise in development and implementation and evaluation of evidence-based strategies to improve health and academic outcomes among children, adolescents, and adults. Now, Lindsay, I, I love the model that you have for your healthy uh, schools. And I would guess that in some way, all the work that has been presented today somehow has a space in that model. And which is why I saved you for last, <laughs> which you probably <laughs> guessed. No pressure. That's no, okay. I'm but, happy to be uh, the caboose. <laughs> I, I'm just, uh, just thrilled to have you here and um, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks. Sorry you had to see my slides as I scrolled backwards. I guess I didn't have them all set up, but I'm assuming that they're displaying correctly now. Um, so thank you, Bob, for the introduction and thanks for all your presentations. And I can already see some really great potential collaborations and overlaps with, with what I do. So I'll start out by, I'm not really presenting results, but I figured I would talk about who I am and what I do and kind of how I do that. And I'll start with kind of who I am. So I am a, uh, my training was in clinical psychology and I had the tremendous good fortune to, to study in Chicago at one of the first CDC funded prevention research centers um, with faculty who, who were really building this multidisciplinary field of prevention science. And then I did a couple NIH funded um, fellowships, one in prevention science and one in implementation science. And so prevention science really is the study of risk and in protective factors that um, relate to well being across the entire lifespan. And I know there's too much information in this slide. I'll just kind of describe sort of who we are and how we do what we do. This work being inter interdisciplinary always takes a team science approach, depending on kind of what topic it is that we're addressing, but um, always those multi sector collaborations and often including practitioners because it's very community engaged work. Uh, to study places where people live, learn, work, worship, and play. You might know this as social determinants of health. And in my case, because so much of my focus is on children and adolescents, I do that work focused on education settings. Um, in terms of topics that we address, really basically any complex social problem, there are prevention scientists studying it, collaborating, trying to understand it. In my case, it's health, it's behavior, it's also academic outcomes. And Talking about risk factors, uh, structural disadvantage is an enormous, profound, widespread risk factor. And prevention science as a field has particularly come to recognize that poverty is just this widespread risk factor that impacts well being. It is in itself considered an adverse childhood experience, leads to a lot of, of complex outcomes. So, really unpacking and focusing those equity issues is key to the work that we do. And then the last two are sort of how we do this work, um, building, pre uh, building interventions to address these uh, topics and then studying them really rigorously through randomized control trials. And then once we know that there is evidence about what works, loading those in evidence-based registries. And then the last part, which is kind of my favorite piece and where I've been spending most of my time over the last probably 10 years or so is on that scale up. So once there's a good evidence base about what works, for various outcomes, then how do we scale that so that it becomes widespread evidence-based practice? And so this is my last slide. Um, instead of presenting results, I'll just kind of share some of the general topics because I apply this approach to so many different topics, one being school nutrition. And about 10 years ago, we had the Healthy Hunger Free Kid Act. It was this very wide ranging policy at the national level that impacted almost all schools across the country. We're talking about almost 100,000 private or uh, public schools and a handful of private schools that offer breakfast and lunch. And this is an important part of the safety net too. So that hunger free aim expanded universal free meals for really high poverty schools. And 
lately with the COVID pandemic, we're seeing that what we've learned early on during some of the earlier rollout, um, there's great opportunities to study what's happening right now because all schools in the nation are able to offer universal free meals during COVID. And personally, I think this is, is profoundly impactful because it addresses that huge risk factor um, and also is that intersection of poverty and child well-being. Another line of research focuses on physical activity at schools and PACE was a um, federally funded study that we just wrapped up. We're still kind of working through a, a few last publications, but really focusing on classroom teachers as the primary implementers of these evidence-based strategies. So we know that brief brain breaks can help kids uh, to be more physically active and also have academic benefits. So starting from the position that this is an effective evidence-based practice, how do we help teachers to put that in place, understanding what some of the barriers are and some of the intervention support strategies. And then last is a um, currently ongoing large-scale randomized control trial. We're working with 40 schools and we're studying the implementation of positive behavioral interventions and support. And this is an evidence-based practice that already has good evidence, but we know that rural schools have a harder time implementing evidence-based practices due to fewer resources and supports. So our study is not testing whether PBIS works, but it's testing this question of how do we help certain schools to more effectively impact these evidence-based practices. So we're gathering a ton of data um, and we'll be looking at that. So basically I'm interested in taking this prevention science and implementation science approach and applying it to all different types of topic with sort of the broad goal of making the world a better place, just, you know, minor <laughs> uh, aspirational goal, but basically <laughs> I, that's where I think there's so many overlaps with all of you who, who've talked today. Basically, if it makes kids healthier, safer, happier, um, it, it's in my wheelhouse and I'm interested. So thanks for, for bringing us together, Bob. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Great. Great presentation. All these have been great. I don't know. Chi Jen, are you still, are you able to present today? Yes. Uh, please, uh, just all of you, please just bear with me for a few minutes. Um, you might hear him, you know, um, screaming uh, once in a while, but I, I think uh, just uh, five minutes, I, I, I can just tell, quickly share with you what I'm, you know, doing right sure. now. Um, go, go for it. Okay. <laughs> Chi Jen's in education. We both, oriented here at the same orientation session in 2018, and we've been friends since. And uh, it's been a pleasure to know Chi Jen. She got her, did her work at University of Nebraska Lincoln, and she looks at academic language and literacy development of multilingual learners and how teacher education can inform the literacy education of those children. Um, thank you, Bob. So right now, uh, Currently, my focus, uh, I mainly have two strands of research. One is uh, uh, preparing uh, teachers and then looking at teacher quality who's working with multilingual uh, students. And then another strand is looking at the literacy development and how to uh, help kids develop their literacy skills. But right now, because of the COVID-19, I have been able to click in any data uh, and everything has been paused. And so, uh, I've been mainly focusing on um, uh, teachers, uh, teachers' quality, and uh, so been using a lot of uh, uh, secondary data sets. Um, and uh, I, what I've found so far is that uh, 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 so general education, both previous uh, pre-service and in-service teachers. Um, knowledge and uh, uh, beliefs to work with multilingual students are related to um, their training. Are related to their training in teacher ed, teacher ed program, um, and then their personal experience, their own uh, experience working with these students, both uh, uh, before they before they jump into the field and then uh, what supports they receive in their first year as well as um, um, the amount of um, diverse students they work with 
uh, in school. And, um, and so, and beyond that, I also, I also work with a team on that. Um, so uh, the training they received in teacher education program in relation to teaching multilingual students are um, related to their sense of preparedness in general teachings that has nothing to do with teaching a multilingual students. So uh, we've been arguing that teaching, you know, um, training them to teach multilingual students is not just good teaching, it's, um, it's great teaching. So, um, and um, currently I'm just, uh, currently I continue to um, work with pre-service teachers to, uh, looking at ways to prepare them to get them more prepared working with this fish to work with this population and uh, uh, um, uh, coming up uh, surveys that might provide more information about their knowledge um, so the other strand the other strand uh, the may actually it's like my main area of research is um, vocabulary, uh, literacy development for this group of students. But right now I'm just working on meta-analysis uh, on intervention effect because I um, um, haven't been able to collect in data. But in the future, I definitely see uh, myself. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. Don't get that. So uh, collecting more data on this topic and, um, and looking looking at uh, cognitive motivational uh, development and, and literacy development for multilingual students. And so um, I I'm I am gonna collect data once I you know once the school opens up, and also uh, at the same time uh, for teacher education I'm interested in. Um, looking at you know broader uh scale which is uh um uh, linking uh the factor that's uh at school community level and see how that's related to teacher quality and also the uh, uh, achievement of this population so uh, and and so any any you know any um anything that's about this population i'm just interested so thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Chi Jen. So that wraps it up today. Uh, really interesting stuff. Um, I'm so glad to get to know a little bit about all the work that you do. Again, Megan Smith sends her regrets that she was ill today and could not present. Um, I've invited her to record a five minute video if she'd like, and I will circulate that to everybody. And you'll get this very handsome, lightning Bo Boise State lightning pin in the mail and a certificate and thank you and I hope to get people together socially sometime in the future too that we might have a you know a, a happy hour or something somewhere together and we can just kind of update each other and meet each other one-on-one -on -one, face to face and just chat anyway I really appreciate your time uh, your energy, the work that you're doing, it just sounds really wonderful. And I look forward to seeing you around campus, hopefully sometime soon. Thank you, everybody.